be with everybody tonight. So wait just another minute or so for everyone to get settled. And you may have noticed um, I put the three refuge chant there in the chat in case you might need that. And as we often do at the beginning of a Buddhist studies class, we'll do this chant. Remember, it's just in a way Buddhist code helping us to remember what we're doing. Buddha is this capacity that we're remembering really to be awake, to open, to be aware. And Dhamma, taking refuge in Dhamma is just the dance of conditions here and now. And Sangha as a refuge, just the more nimble and creative and kind and wise way we can relate and engage and show up when we're coming from this place of Buddha, being intimate with Dhamma, being awake to the way it is. But it's really up to each of us to have a relationship to what these three words point to, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, right? So we need to go beyond just what the words say and they're sort of pointers to a way we can be here, a way we can be relating and experiencing the moment right here and now. Otherwise, it's just another idea to cling to <laughs> and can actually turn out to be a cause for suffering. So let's go ahead and do this chant slowly together I have you all muted, of course, that uh, you'll hear my voice, but feel free to chant along or just to reflect on that quality of Buddha being this capacity we have to be awake and the possibility of being awake to actually how it is right now, this activity of the body and mind. And the fact that we can be showing up and relating in a kind way with a lot of integrity, that's Sangha right here and now. It doesn't have to relate or um, be about another moment down the road when we're in the middle of a complicated life situation. The reality of Sangha or any of these three refuges can come alive right now. So let's begin. Udang Saranang Gachami Damang Saranang Gachami Sangang Saranang Gachami Dutyampi Budang Saranang Gachami Dutyampi Damang Saranang Gachami Dutyampi Sangang Saranang Gachami <clears throat> Tatyampi Budang Saranang Gachami Tatyampi Damang Saranang Gachami Tatyampi 
Sangang Saranang Kachami And we take the time, listen to the body, adjust the posture. And we're really creating something beautiful in our sitting posture. Regardless of our particular body, a posture that for our body has a lot of integrity. That's that quality of uprightness. So the posture supporting wakefulness whatever that might look like in our particular situation. And the body is also reflecting relaxation, being at ease, being open and soft. So both of those qualities are equally important, alertness and relaxation in the body. and growing roots into the experience of sensation here and now. And let there be this ringing truth. There is this body, feels like this now. Can this be okay? Yeah, this can be okay. This body feeling like this. this movement, at times even a wild movement of sensation, coolness or warmth, hardness, softness, stillness, flow, so many different aspects of this flow of sensation that is the body. And as we settle, we're learning that it's quite useful, skillful to give the body permission to be the way it is. Not needing it to be different than it is. And this is in particular in particular, it's interesting this evening as we're going to be interested in the experience of pain or discomfort. Pain isn't, you know, the habit is for any even mildly painful sensations, the habit is to, for the mind to interpret the discomfort, the pain as a personal problem. And we really want to shift seeing pain, discomfort, intensity of sensation as a teacher. So let's do a simple body scan as we've done before, beginning by just allowing the attention to open to all the different sensations now in the head, the face, the skull, top of the head, forehead and brow, feeling both eyes just as they are, simple sensations like the eyelids touching the eyes, any tension in the brow, feel the temples, Notice the jaw, perhaps some tension. Notice the lips, the teeth and gums, the tongue, the lips. Feel the air touching the skin of the face. 
the entire head, the sides and back of the head, any pressure within the head, any pain, and a real confident, kind presence now with all the sensations in the head and face as they are. Everything belongs, everything can be allowed to be the way it is. And all these sensations here in the head and face, of course, are in motion, changing, intensifying or weakening, depending. Can this be okay that the head, the face is this way? Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's okay just to allow everything to be here as it is. And down into the throat, the neck, especially the sides of the neck and down into the tops of the shoulders. Take your time. And allowing the awareness simply to settle or soak in here. Feeling the throat and neck tops of the shoulders just as they are now. So we're learning how to be joyfully interested. No real agenda except to connect and sustain this wise presence, this kind presence. And in particular, interested any places that feel hard or tight, what we might consider unpleasant sensation. See if you can bring a different attitude of real curiosity, really watching out for that habit of presuming that painful sensation is a personal problem. Maybe it's just those sensations being known. So really having a fresh attitude, a new attitude when noticing what might be considered painful sensation, even if they're intense. Take our time, just willing to feel whatever's here in the shoulders, tops of the shoulders, the joints, and eventually down both arms, underarms. Relearning how to be intimate with something ordinary, like all the different sensations in both arms, the bend of the elbows, Feel the sleeves touching the skin where they do and other predominant touch points, contact. Feel the air touching the back of the hands perhaps, the temperature. Feeling each finger Taking your time with a lot of patience. Any tension in the hands. And it's a, really, it's a profound, courageous act of Intimacy to choose to be aware of both arms and hands just as they are. And in doing that, we let go of everything else. This is our only interest right now to be intimate with the arms and hands, fingers. Just feeling the enormity, the complexity of the sensations flowing on and on in these parts of the body.
And the whole rest of the body, of course, is there in the background. And now bringing one's interest to the trunk, beginning at the top, so we feel the collarbones and the upper back and the upper chest and the upper part of the rib cage, of course. In a really patient and generous way, just opening, receiving, and allowing these sensations here in the upper part of the torso to be the way they are. We're not second guessing, we're not trying to fix. And again, as I said, we're relearning how to be interested in a very beautiful or pure way just to receive what's here in the upper chest and upper back the rib cage, feeling the gentle movement of expansion and contraction in the rib cage. Maybe even sensing the beating of the heart. Any tension by the shoulder blades even if it's unpleasant, just willing to include, willing to learn how to be interested and intimate. And down into the lower ribs, all the way down into the solar plexus, the kidneys and diaphragm areas. Take your time. And if ever you discover that there's some resistance or controlling energy, just be curious about the sensation of that in the body. Feeling the belly and all the abdominal organs and the lower back, of course, and the spine here. And eventually down into the pelvis, feeling the structure, the bones here, the sits bones, and the floor, the pelvis, the groin, hip sockets, taking it all in. And in each place of the body, just noticing the enormity and complexity and real beauty of the flow of sensation, the movement of sensation. And we're learning to relate to the body with a sense of interest and awe and forgiveness and patience and just a general sense of allowing or acceptance. This is how it is in the body now. So beginning down both legs when you're ready. Again, just notice the obvious touch points here in the legs, the thighs first. Any bend in the knees, from the thighs to the calves and shins. Feel the slacks against the skin, coolness or warmth. Feeling both ankles. Simply opening to the heels that place of contact, pressure, sides and tops of the feet. Bottoms of the feet. Toes.
And without rushing, taking our time, we open to the whole body. A really beautiful and generous presence with the body. There is this sitting, breathing body, this flow of sensation, pleasant and unpleasant, probably a lot neutral as well. Everything belongs now in this movement of sensation. Nothing needs to be ignored or excluded. And of course, if there is some resistance or tightness, constriction, make sure to include that as part of the flow of sensation here. And as we're as we continue to open and allow this experience of the whole body, <clears throat> we offer the body this experience of stillness. So both on this level of keeping the body still from a place of relaxation. So it isn't a forced or a tight stillness of the body. It's a kind of gift, no matter what comes and goes in the body, a sensation, choosing to remain still, peaceful. At this time, nothing needs to be fixed. These sensations pleasant or not, don't really need to be different than they are. And that allows for the stillness. And we can notice the stillness in the body. as a outer reflection of acceptance. And of course, the stillness won't be perfect. It's just a matter of deeply valuing a stillness that comes out of relaxation and acceptance. In a funny way, the stillness of the sitting body is a gift to the whole world when it's coming out of relaxation and acceptance. We're simply connecting and sustaining this kind presence with the whole body, whole body awareness as you're breathing in, whole body awareness as you're breathing out. Let it be really simple. Learn how to deeply trust this whole body awareness as you breathe in, whole body awareness as you breathe out.
And then of course, at times, painful sensations may arise or maybe have been there. And they'll come into the forefront of attention in a sense, asking for attention. So it's totally okay to allow painful sensations to be the object of awareness. So then the whole body might be in the background, the periphery of attention, and the particular painful sensations may be there in the foreground. Breathing in, aware of this painful sensation, breathing out, allowing these painful sensations to be And of course, we'll notice the impulse to want to fix or control or move the body. So acknowledge any resistance to the pain as something being known. And when the mind identifies with the resistance, then there's suffering. There's the sense I'm suffering. This is not okay. And we notice what that feels like to be the one having a problem with the painful sensation. And there's an alternative, which is to actually authentically be interested in the throbbing or the burning or the twisting or the whatever the qualities that make up what we're calling the painful bodily experience, to bring a fresh and curious, open attention. In some moments feeling the general area of the pain and in other moments deconstructing, feeling the different elements of the painful sensations, the hardness of it or the burning of it the aching of it, the numbness of it. So just curious about all the specific characteristics of what we're calling the pain. Even to the place where we're curious about the points of greatest intensity. And is that point of greatest intensity constant or is that changing? Here in one moment, there in another moment, increasing, decreasing, changing. So just this wholesome wish to see, see things as they are, feel things as they are. So when we open to painful sensations, it isn't about making, wanting the pain to go away. It's really this more wholesome wish to understand the nature of pain as a present moment phenomena. What makes painful sensation into suffering? where somebody feels burdened, put upon. And is there a way to be with pain that is free of that somebody who's suffering, nobody having a problem with it? Is that possible? And finally, we want to learn both how to turn toward the pain in any moment, but also it can be quite skillful to learn how to turn away so that we don't always feel like we have to pay attention to whatever's painful. We can learn to let the painful sensations fall into the background 
And let the more neutral or even pleasant sensations come into the foreground. Just by asking, well, what else can be known in the present moment? Oh, the air touching the skin of my face, that's not unpleasant, that's neutral. Well, let me choose to pay attention to this neutral experience of air touching the skin of my face. This body is our teacher. And it's going to teach us how to be embodied and free, unburdened. So go ahead, take a little time, adjust your posture, stretch a little. And again, really nice to be with everybody tonight. Week two in our eight week study of mindfulness of the body one of the really central teachings in the Dhamma, in the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha. And uh, I've really been liking over the years of just referring to the body, to the breath and the body as our, I mean, it, it really, like the world itself, it's a working ground. And this is a good thing to be reminded, a lot of you have heard this many times, but we tend to think wrongly that the body is here to provide me with pleasant experience. And so when we have a lot of painful experiences in the body, being a little too cold or getting old or whatever it might be, we feel somewhat betrayed. And this is the, the parallel to this unhelpful expectation that the body is kind of my slave. Its job is to make me happy. We have some kind of similar attitude about the, the world generally, our partners, our pets, the weather. It's really here to create the conditions for my happiness. And when the world doesn't do that, we feel like that's not fair. Don't you know what you're here for? <laughs> you're supposed to be making me happy. But you know, the Buddha is very clear. And of course, when we reflect upon it, it makes so much sense that the world isn't here. That would be such a, a sort of a, a, an abomination to think that nature, the world, its sole purpose is here to make me happy. I mean, right? That's such a a uh, crazy idea, but it's the same with the body. The body is just the body. It's neither for us nor against us, you know? And when we're feeling good, we think the body is for us. And we're not feeling good in the body, we think it's like out to get us. But the body is neither for us nor out to get us. And we want to cultivate this realistic, grounded, relationship with the body, you know, not idealistic. And so when we, we want to consider it a working ground, a teacher, and it really like by when we're curious, when we're open, when we're sustaining present moment awareness with the body, this working ground of the body, this dynamic or movement of sensation. And of course, 
being profoundly intimate with the body, we can't help but be profoundly intimate, aware of the mind, because it's the mind that knows the body. But the body is such a useful gateway to the present moment, because it's just more apparent, more concrete, more easily known, right? But don't ever think, you know, even though in Buddhism and generally, you know, we talk about the body and we talk about the mind, but there's no body without the mind. So we're really using the body to be intimate with the totality of the present moment, which is the mind. The mind is the relevant piece there. But the body and the mind are tethered, they reflect each other, and it's our teacher. And, and just as we'd actually you know, if we actually had a teacher we deeply respected, that's how we want to relate to the present moment and to the bodily experience of the present moment, like with a lot of gratitude to be able to connect and learn and a lot of patience and a lot of humility. One of the real obstacles for our work these eight weeks as we study mindfulness of the body is you know, we're just so arrogantly certain we know what the body is. And on some level, we do have ideas, you know, conceptual images, ideas of what the body is. But that ain't the body, that's an idea. And the body is something that is moment to moment. It's only known in the moment. Because as a aspect of reality, it can't actually be grasped with words or concepts. It can be with practice and the sort of purifying how the mind knows, the way the mind relates, i.e. we're teasing out the greed, teasing out the hate and aversion, teasing out the distractedness and delusion. And so the way the mind is knowing, is relating, becomes more pure or more clear, more intimate. So in this way, we can get to know the body. And in knowing the body, we know the mind. And in knowing the body and the mind, we know the causes for suffering and the causes for release. And knowing the causes for suffering and the causes for release, the mind wakes up and realizes the freedom that's available that the Buddha points to in his teachings. So uh, some of you know the five remembrances. I am of the nature to grow old. I have not gone beyond aging. I'm of the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. I'm the, of the nature to die. I haven't gone, this body hasn't gone beyond death. All that's mine, all my possessions, all that's beloved to me, that will be taken from me eventually. Everything goes away. I am the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, born out of my karma. Karma meaning just intentional actions. Whatever <clears throat> actions I do with intention, of that I will be the heir. So this is our predicament, and it's just one way of understanding, and the Buddha kind of setting up this working ground, like it can't be other than what it is. So we have just in a sort of superficial sense, we have two options. One is to struggle with the conditions, the circumstances to try to get them the way we want them to be. And the other option is to use the circumstances like the circumstances of our bodily experience as a teacher. And what are we studying? The causes for suffering and the causes for release. And one image in the tradition is, um, you know, in terms of solving our problem as a human being is because there is a lot of suffering, if you haven't noticed, including just this ordinary bodily suffering of being too cold or too warm or too much food in the belly, not enough food in the belly, indigestion, ill health, sickness, all the different afflictions that just naturally come with having a body. 
itches, <laughs> dry skin, so many different things. It's amazing. Amazing if we, you know, like if we were conceptual artists and we had a big wall, white wall at our house, and every time there was a discomfort, bodily discomfort, you know, we just put a little post-it. Not, not the big three by three inch post-its, you know, but tiny, I think there's ones that are like one inch by one and a half inch, you know, just made a little note. And we had a 20 foot by 10 foot high wall, you know, and just how long, it wouldn't take that long before the entire wall was filled like, yeah, this was a little bit off. It was a little hard, a little too much, this too little that, all the slight or not so slight discomforts. It's endless, right? And we could do the same. It would be harder for us, right? Because we're more attentive to the discomforts, but it would be equally valuable to have another wall where we would just post all the little moments of pleasantness, bodily pleasantness, warmth when we want the warmth, <laughs> touch when we want the touch, those sorts of things. Putting on your favorite sweater. <laughs> oh, that feels good against my skin. Taking off your itchy sweater. Oh, that feels so good. <laughs> and we post it. And we it would just help represent to us that this is the very nature of life, this flow of sensation and the mind interpreting this endless flow of sensation as being pleasant or unpleasant or neutral, on and on and on. And there's just so many, like even in this moment, there's really almost an infinite diversity of different sensations, each of which is either pleasant or unpleasant or neutral, right? Like I don't have socks on, I have a pair of slippers, but that little space between my slippers and my pants and my ankle, that's cold, that's unpleasant, you know? But then my toes are a little warm in my slippers, maybe a little too warm, you know? And there's, there's this and there's that, and I don't think there's any end. And even when we're sort of aware of the different, they're immediately changing, and the unpleasantness in one little location may be intensifying, becoming even more unpleasant. In another place, the, pleasant, the pleasantness may be diminishing or increasing. So even with the complexity or the diversity of the sensations, each of which is either pleasant or unpleasant, all of that is in motion. Nothing is static or constant. We imagine it's static, but it really isn't when we look carefully. It's quite alive. And the reason I'm spending time on this is it really affects the experience of suffering because suffering, like due to physical pain, Suffering is a construction. There is sensation plus resistance, mental resistance. A lot of you know this story from the suttas. Um, it doesn't, it's from the time of the Buddha, but it doesn't involve the Buddha. It actually involves a lay person named Chitta. And by the way, Chitta is just the word for the heart, the mind uh, in, Buddhas, in Buddhism and Pali. And so there was a guy named Chitta, and he was a lay person, not a monk, but he was a very devoted student of the Buddha and was, had some real wisdom. And he liked that, uh, to go visit the monks um, after they had their one meal of the day, because they'd often sit around after the meal and talk about practice. And so he'd go and he'd listen and learn some things. And over the years of his practice and listening, he had become quite wise. And one day he heard this argument where there was a group of practitioners and monastics arguing or having a discussion and they were trying to get to the root of how suffering comes to be for human beings and half of the group was arguing that the reason we suffer is that we're so sensitive we're sensitive to experience we're sensitive to touches sensation we're sensitive to sight to sound to smells to taste we're sensitive to our even our mental activity if we weren't sensitive if we weren't so exposed there wouldn't be suffering and then the other half of the group you know as the story goes at least 
We start, no, 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 it's not the sensitivity. The problem is the objects that we're sensitive to. So they think the other half, they were arguing like if we only had pleasant visual objects and pleasant sounds and pleasant touches and smells and tastes and pleasant thoughts, then there wouldn't be a problem. And so they were arguing like this and they saw that Chitta was listening in. So they, which would be a little strange for monastics to ask a lay person to weigh in because it's sort of not common. And so anyway, they did because they respected Chitta. Like, what do you think about this? And Chitta gave them the simile of a uh, uh, ox cart and two oxen. One was darker colored, one was lighter colored. And they were yoked together, you know, the wooden yoke that held the beasts. So when they were pulling the cart, they kind of worked together. And they, he, he asked the, the monks that were arguing, okay, would you say that the darker ox is a fetter, a burden to the lighter color one? Or would you say the lighter color one is the burden to the darker color one? And, you know, they weren't stupid. So they said, well, neither one is a burden to the other. The problem is that they're yoked together. That's what creates the burden for them. And he used that as an image for understanding why pain, painful sensation, unpleasant sensation is a problem. Is it that I'm sensitive to the touches, to the sensations in my body? Or is it that the particular sensations I have are bad, not the ones I want? Or is it something that the mind, because of habit, constructs the yoke, right? It constructs something um, on top of or dependent on the sensitivity being sensitive to certain touches. So the, the sort of simple, the most simple reality is that there's a knowing, knowing some experience. So in the case of the body, there's sensitivity, knowing the experience of the body as sensation. But something arises in conjunction with that exposure, that contact feeling, the feeling tone, the pleasantness, unpleasantness, my habit-based mind determining, I like this sensation, I don't like this sensation. And all the ideas that quickly follow, I want to get rid of this. Or why is this happening to me? This isn't fair. You don't seem to be suffering from this. When is this going to go away? Should I adjust myself? So this is the thing we can do in our practice, in our sitting practice, we can get interested in the yoke. There's really nothing, I mean, there are some things we can do about sensitivity, and there's a few things we can do about what we're sensitive to. You know, like when we're sitting still in meditation, and some stiffness, some painful sensation related to holding still arises, the ankle starts to hurt or the back starts to hurt after 30 minutes or whatever it is, you know, we could always move or if it's not too overwhelming, we could get interested in the bodily experience as a teacher. Okay. There's sensitivity and there's sensation that the sensitivity that the knowing mind is sensitive to. And then there's a problem that arises in conjunction like, and I don't like what I'm feeling. And when is this sit going to be over? And why am I sitting anyway when I could be watching TV, lounging on the couch and drinking my favorite beverage? And so wisdom and awareness is sitting there observing this. Okay, there's the sensation, there's the knowing, there's the mental activity arising in conjunction the emotional and mental activity, what we might call in moments at least resistance or not liking in terms of at least painful sensations or wanting it to be different. But some kind of self-centered drama. And this is what we want to discover that the suffering is optional. Sensitivity to what's coming and going in the body 
not optional. I mean, there's around the edges, we can do some things. I could go take a break and put some socks on and the unpleasant coolness in my ankles right now would go away. I'm in a room that has a lot of south, a lot of uh, windows that get a lot of sun. And so during the day, it's really warm. We turn the heat down. And then about this time, it starts to get really cold because there's so many windows and we forgot to turn the heat back up. <laughs> so especially around the floor, you know, it's really cool. And so uh, that exposure to the coolness, that's just sort of those sort of experiences come with the territory of having a sensitive body, having a knowing mind, a sensitive heart, and the exposure that comes with having a body, being alive in a body, being an animal, an aging animal that was born vulnerable to sickness and aging and death, vulnerable to loss, vulnerable to, you know, that last reflection in the five remembrance vulnerability exposure to karma just means it's not only the present moment experience that I'm exposed to, what else am I exposed to? What, are, what else are all of us exposed to right now? It's not just like the coldness of my ankles that I'm exposed to, but when we sit, especially when we get a little bit more settled, sometimes the pain, the physical discomfort, the energetic discomfort we feel, it has to do not with present moment causes, but we're really feeling the heaviness, the ache, the stiffness of past causes, right? Like if I've been really an angry person for many years, so when I sit still and get quiet and settle, I'm going to feel the body that has been exposed to all those years of anger then the body feels like this, it's tight like this. And that tightness isn't because of something I'm doing in this moment, it's the karmic fruit of what I've been doing with my body for so long. Same with diet and all kinds of habits around exercise and overusing the body or underusing the body and the karma of the kind of jobs we've had and the toxicity we've been exposed to and whether you've given birth and how many times you've given birth to, to children and, you know, all those kinds of things. There are causes and effects to those causes. So when we settle down, there's the present moment causes for the pleasantness and unpleasantness in our body. And there's the uh, older causes that the fruit of those older causes then may arise then now in this moment. And the point I'm making really is just that, just normalizing this exposure. Because if we think we're going to solve this exposure, the image the Buddha uses, I forget if I mentioned this, I was meaning to mention it earlier in the talk. It's like trying to cover the world in leather is the image from the early Buddhist tradition. Like there's a lot of sharp stones and other um, things that can cut your foot when you're walking around barefoot. So I've got a brilliant plan. I'm going to cover the world in leather. Well, that ain't going to be easy, right? Or so much wiser would be just to build or make a pair of shoes. And then I don't have a problem with all the sharp objects. So this simile, I guess, has been used in uh, Theravada Buddhism for a long time. Dharma practice, this practice we're all interested in and doing, it's like having been exhausted trying to make the world perfect. So my sensitivity to the exposure of having a body is palatable, is acceptable, constantly trying to make everything just right. And, you know, in living in a, most of us living in an affluent place, it's just amazing. I was thinking about this earlier this evening. You know, you lift the faucet up and you get hot and cold water that's pretty clean. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> when you think about however long human beings have been walking this planet and that we can just go not just to one place, but many of our apartments and homes have many of those faucets where we just get nice water. 
We even have clean water in our toilets. It's really astounding. And then we got these little knobs that make the place hotter or colder. You know, we have amazing clothes. And, you know, walking down a large grocery store, it's just incredible. What we've done, it's basically our attempt to cover the world in leather. Has it worked? No. And, and the amazing thing is those of you who have traveled to places where there isn't as much affluence, we're not any happier than generally speaking. I mean, obviously if someone is really sick or the poverty is extreme, there can be real suffering there. But a lot of the people who have much, much, much less than us are not necessarily less happy than those of us who have, you know, many more physical comforts. So that, that should get our attention. So what we want to get interested in is like, how do I build a pair of shoes and break that habit of trying to cover the world in leather, trying to deal with the experience of being sensitive to the body. So just simplifying our experience as a human being, just to this one area of like being sensitive to the bodily experience of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touches. What are we going to do about that exposure being in a body? Are we going to put all our energy? Cause we're definitely going to use some energy to be comfortable, put a sweater on when we're cold, put socks on when the ankles are cold, right? So I'm not saying we don't do those things, but is that our only strategy? Or is there another thing to do with our energy that really can resolve the problem of knowing sensitivity, being exposed to the sensation, to the bodily experience? One of the ways, and maybe I'll just end with this uh, piece, and this is a sutta, a discourse that many of you have heard before. Um, the second dart or the second arrow is how the title is translated. And it's a really powerful teaching um, where the Buddha is saying that he's really talking about this problem of pain, which is really the topic tonight. And in our small groups, for those of you who can stay, um, this is like such a great thing for human beings to talk together about. How am I relating to pain? And just, I mean, it's a, it could be emotional pain, it could be any level, but just this basic level of physical pain. It's so uh, relevant for us to learn from each other what works and what doesn't work. And how endless it is to always have that only strategy be to fix it or to get rid of it. And so in this discourse in the second dart, he says, you know, being human being means we're gonna get hit with darts. We're gonna stub our toe, we're gonna to get sick, things like that. And the Buddha says in this discourse, being touched by painful feeling, an untrained person sorrows, becomes miserable, is aggrieved, wails beating the breast and becomes bewildered. This person feels two types of feeling, bodily and mental. On being touched, on being touched by that painful feeling, the person becomes aversive towards it, right? And this feels so natural because it's a very deep habit. It just seems rational to us to hate pain. So in your small groups tonight, or if you can't, uh, or whatever, aren't gonna stay for the small group, then try to find a good Dharma friend, somebody who practices, who understands what you're doing here in this class to, or even journaling, but, but better to talk to another person about like, um, one, just how that doesn't work to have all the, only that strategy of needing to get rid of it. Because what the Buddha says next is, is really uh, tragic. The sutta goes on, being touched by that painful feeling, this person delights in the pleasure of sensuality. Why is that? 
because this untrained person does not know any other escape from painful feeling other than the pleasure of sensuality. So all of our dependence, all of our neurotic, addictive dependence on nice experiences arises. It's not that having pleasant experience is bad. I mean, it's great to have pleasant experience. But, but me, this heart being dependent on it so that I feel I suffer when I don't have it, that dependence on pleasure arises because I don't know what to do with pain. And when I get dependent on pleasure as my only antidote to pain. Now, remember, pleasure can also be getting rid of the pain. Or if I can't get rid of the pain, I can go drink. Or I can eat some candy. Or I can watch an exciting movie that takes my mind off of the pain. So there's different ways that we use pleasure to manage pain. But it really skews our relationship to pleasure like we get tight around it. So in a way we contaminate the ordinary and beautiful experience of pleasure when it comes our way, because it's not just pleasure, it's I need it to get some distance from the pain, the unavoidable ordinary pain in life. And it goes further, you know, in this discourse, then the Buddha talks about how our relationship to neutrality which really turns out to be most of our experience in life is relatively neutral, then we start to ignore neutrality because we're so desperate to manage our pain that we're fixated on pleasure so that we ignore neutral. And then we feel so disconnected because so much of life is relatively neutral. And it throws the whole life off. And then we're suffering. We're just a suffering being. So in the small groups tonight, you can talk about what is your relationship to pain? And you might just, especially just ground it in our bodily experience. So, you know, things you don't like, <laughs> physical things you don't like. And what do you do about them? What are the strategies? What works for you? And how is it really working, right? And to really think about the second arrow, like, because this is the alternative, you know, just the summation is just this very short, pithy bit of advice. This is from a different discourse from the Buddha now. Um, and and I, one of the articles I sent out today in the email, if you didn't get an email from me this afternoon, it means you're not on the Buddhist studies email list which means you need to either send me an email if you have my email address or just send it to the center and either Gabe or I will get you on the Buddhist studies email list. I don't, I don't know, maybe I sent it around four o'clock and it has lots of resources, including a short article by Venerable Analio where he's talking about this discourse. And he also quotes this other discourse where the Buddha says, therefore practitioners, you should train yourself like this. Though my body is afflicted, i.e. with physical pain, my mind will not be afflicted. And that's a little bit like a koan, like a little mystery. How can that be? Like in when I was sitting tonight doing the guided meditation with you, my ankles were cold, like I said earlier. So when I wasn't talking and I could just be more directly with the experience in the body, I got to explore that exact question. Although I'm afflicted by the coolness of my ankles, that's unpleasant, right? How might it be that the mind or the heart remains unafflicted, completely unburdened? Now the place for us to explore this isn't those times in the next few weeks where we're experiencing really sharp or intense discomfort but just the ordinary discomforts that come our way, being a little hot, being a little cold, being a little tired, being a little restless in the body. And just sort of get curious, like, yeah, maybe, because some of those things you might actually be able to do something to make it go away. But maybe before you do those things, just explore 
how you can, through practice, abandon the mental resistance, the mental suffering. So all there is left is the physical sensations being known. What is pain? What is painful sensation, discomfort, when there's no mental resistance? This is another topic you can bring up in your small groups tonight. So I'm really grateful for Michelle, who I think is on. Um, and Michelle, I'll make you the host. Please, I'm gonna give a few announcements. So if you could just hang on for another moment, let me just do this first. Uh, Michelle Hobbs, right? I'm just remembering your last name, Michelle. And I'm making you the host. And so for those people who are gonna stay on for the small groups, you stay on. But before you leave, I just wanna announce that uh, um, one about make sure you get the Buddhist studies email, contact us if you don't. There's a day long retreat this coming Saturday, lots of space if anybody wants to join in. Shelley Graf and I will be lead, leading a two day retreat the Friday and Saturday of President's Weekend, which is the middle weekend in February. Um, yeah, and, and then I wanted to say something about the small groups, which is a, just to create this time when we come together in groups of three or four as a kind of sacred space for those who are staying on. And Michelle will divide you up when you show up in your small group, then introduce yourself. You may say your pronouns. So you're not going to accidentally misgender yourselves. Might say where you're from. And then one of you volunteer to go first and you might want a timer, but there should be plenty of time for each person to have two or three minutes. And we really give people the two or three minutes, even if they run out of things to say, then really practice together, just sitting for the remainder of that person's time. And you're just reflecting on what you've learned about pain and any of the instructions that came last week where, you know, I mentioned the uh, uh, instructions about just your postures and stretching and reaching and all the just different aspects of the bodily experience. And what have you been learning in your study of pain and in your experience of embodiment and, and how the, this intimacy with the body informs our understanding how suffering comes to be and how suffering can be diminished. And we hold whatever said in confidentiality in the small groups, it's really just for that group. We take, uh, there should be like three to seven minutes at the end for just an open discussion after each person has had a turn. Yeah, and then the last point is just to use your practice of mindfulness of the body when you're speaking and when you're listening, it really helps to listen if you're aware of your body as you're listening. Everybody, I look forward to seeing you next Monday evening for week three. And just uh, you can feel free to leave now if you're not going to stay for the small groups. Otherwise, just hang on in a, about a minute. Michelle will divide you up into small groups. Have a nice conversation.